What's up, bio nerdlings? In this podcast, we're going to be discussing genetic drift. Let's get started. So genetic drift, by definition, is a non-selective process that occurs in small populations. The reduction of genetic variation within a given population can increase the differences between populations of the same species. So the Severall from Africa, the Canadian lynx from North America, and the margay from South America are all the same species, but as you can see, they all have very, very different outside appearance or phenotypic characteristics. And that's due to genetic drift. So gene flow is when a population gains or loses alleles. So some alleles are passed on from one population to the next and we have alleles being exchanged. And that's the flow of genes. So of movement of fertile individuals that's either leaving or arriving from one population to the other. And it reduces differences between populations because it's an even mix. So genetic drift is a change in the allele frequencies due to chance, not natural selection, so pure chance. So for example, a population of you know beetles and bam, somebody steps on them and all of a sudden wipes out like three of the green beetles and now only one of them is left. So again, it's due to chance, not natural selection. So again, it usually occurs in smaller populations that have been cut off from the main population meaning that there's no gene flow into or out of that gene pool. And it also happens in very large populations, but the effect can be very insignificant, meaning it doesn't really matter if it's a huge population. Uh, it will reduce genetic variation. So the example of this, and I, I've talked about it before with little bunny rabbits. So, you know, we're in a forest, we have gene flow going on, you know, huge populations of bunny rabbits, uh, tree falls, knocks one of those rabbits in a million rabbit population, you know, wipes him out of the gene pool, not going to be a huge, you know, deficit. There's not going to be much of a change in that gene pool because we have 999,900, you know, uh, rabbits left. Now, if we have a population of only 10 rabbits and bam, you know, tree falls down, knocks out one rabbit, that is going to be a significant change because the population was much smaller to begin with. So allele frequencies drift away from the original populations. So if we look down here, we have our original population and it's starting to drift away. So we start out with five blue spheres, five red spheres, and five yellow spheres. Second generation, we have seven blue, three red, and five yellow. The third generation, we still have seven blue spheres. We have four red and we have four yellow. Fourth generation, we have eight blue spheres, two red, and five yellow, and by the end, or the fifth generation, we have nine blue spheres, and we have six yellow. So again, it's drifted away from that original population. So genetic drift can be most profound in populations that are dramatically reduced, um, like a bottleneck population. And it's usually due to some type of environmental catastrophe, and you know, sometimes we're the cause of that environmental catastrophe. Um, also, genetic drift occurs when a small population arrives at a new habitat, such as an island, so we're colonizing something. So the first one we're going to talk about is the bottleneck effect. The second one I'm going to talk about is called the founder effect. Make sure that you write these two down. You definitely need to be able to differentiate between bottleneck effect and founder effect and give an example of each. So the bottleneck effect is when a population has been dramatically reduced and the gene pool is no longer reflective of the gene pool of the original population. So right here we have the original population goes through a bottleneck. That's why they say bottleneck because basically we start off with this huge population and then only a few little individuals get out. So basically bottle gets dumped over, we go through a bottleneck and only a few of the original population are left. That's what's left to contribute their genes to the gene pool, breed and repopulate. So the bottleneck effect right here, we have, you know, green, we have orangish, reddish, we have purple, goes to the bottleneck effect, we have three purple, um, and we might have a blue, or it might have a recessive trait for a blue, and that's how we wound up with a blue in the surviving population. Um, so as you can see, there's absolutely no red spheres left because it went through a bottleneck. So human actions can actually create, of course, a genetic bottleneck effect. Um, through hunting. So we've done that to cheetah, 
Uh, we've also done that to elephant seals. So this is one of the big examples that I'm going to give you. Uh, the smaller population, the more vulnerable it is to genetic drift. So way back in the day, uh, there were probably about a population of 100 to 150,000 uh, northern elephant seals that run along the coast, um, you know, California, Mexico, up and down that coast. So, you know, through hunting, basically, they were wiped out, and it was estimated that that population was wiped out to about 50 elephant seals. So from 100,000 to 50. Now, those 50 individuals were the ones that were left to breed, pass on their genes to their offspring, and basically repopulate. Now we have about 150 northern elephant seals left. So one of the interesting facts that they found was that we had all these skulls left in the Smithsonian from you know before all of the hunting. And so what scientists did was they looked at the skull morphology or the external appearance, and they wanted to see how you know how aligned this skull was. They wanted to know if it was you know basically correct on each side. So they wanted to know if the skull was symmetrical or asymmetrical compared to that original population. And what they found was that the original population had very symmetrical skulls, meaning the right half and the left half were pretty much the same. Now, after that bottleneck occurred, because there were only 50 individuals that were left to repopulate, they found that all of the skulls were very asymmetrical, meaning the sides did not match up. They also were able to run DNA tests, so they extracted DNA from the leftover um, bones of the elephant seals from the Smithsonian Museum, and they found that there was a much less genetic diversity between the population then. So that's kind of an example of the bottleneck effect, going from a huge population where only, and then going to through the bottleneck to where only a couple little ones survive, and those are left to repopulate, and then the, the new population might be very skewed from the older population because only a few of those genes got passed. So the next we're going to talk about is called the founder effect. This is when a small number of individuals colonize a new area and a new gene pool is not reflective of the original population. So for example, uh, we have Amish people and they exhibit polydactyly. Poly means many and dactyly is referring to our fingers. So they have six fingers. So the Amish community was founded by a small number of colonists. So that's what we're talking about, the huge population. So population of, you know, the world, you know, there's not a lot of polydactyly. But because a very small percentage of that population moved and colonized somewhere, those were the people that were left to, for better lack of terms, breed and pass on those genetic traits to their offspring. So the founding group possessed that gene for polydactyly. And the Amish population has increased in size, but it's remained pretty much genetically isolated because there are not a lot of people that go into that population and actually become part of that uh, population. So as a result, polydactyly is much more frequent in the Amish communities than it is in other communities. So again, founder effect. Well, I hope you learned a little bit about genetic drift today. If you need to rewatch this video or any others for AP Biology or AP Environmental Science, you can check out my website at nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing off for now. Stay nerdy till next time.